In the midst of the Cold War, as communism was on the rise and growing across the world, fear and paranoia swept across much of America. And onto that stage exploded a nobody senator from Wisconsin, spewing wild, baseless, and incredulous accusations that the American government was riddled with communist traitors at the highest levels. In the climate of fear that he helped orchestrate, Thousands of innocent lives were ruined, essential liberties were tarnished and sacrificed, and even two presidents feared to cross the man whose name would forever scar this dark era in American history, McCarthyism. After years of witch hunts, he would finally be exposed by the power of television, bringing about his swift downfall. But how could such a phony and a fraud gain such popularity and power in a country that cherishes freedom and individualism? Well, that's just the treasure we're out to discover. I'm Dan Luer, and this is History for Humans. In the 1920s, after the First World War, America experienced its first Red Scare, red being synonymous with communism. But not to be outdone, after the Second World War, there was a second Red Scare. And like most sequels, it was much worse than the original. The Red Scare simply describes the time when there was a heightened fear of communism throughout the country that led to a loss of civil liberties. And Joseph McCarthy was the senator and savior that millions of Americans believed was going to drive out all the communists and the traitors who were assumed to be lurking throughout our government. Joseph McCarthy grew up poor and tough on a farm in Wisconsin. He was also a veteran of the war and rose in politics to be the youngest member of the Senate when he was elected in 1946 in Wisconsin. But his first few years in the Senate were marked by, well, how unremarkable they were. He didn't accomplish much of anything and didn't draw much attention except for some Senate colleagues who realized he had a tendency to lie and exaggerate for his own benefit. Foreshadowing! Though known to spin yarn about all sorts of things, he played especially fast and loose with his war record. His nickname, Tail Gunner Joe, stemmed from one of his most courageous and honorable exploits during the war. Wanting to prove his mettle, he set off with a pilot daring to make a name for himself. On this one mission, he set the record for the most ammunition fired on a single flight during the war. And despite there being no Japanese forces anywhere to be found, he fired wildly and excitedly into the blue sea and torched coconut trees down to the stump. After breaking the record, he got the publicity, the nickname, and it was enough to seem a war hero, shredding coconut trees like nobody's business. But as the Red Scare was taking hold of the country, McCarthy realized he could once again play the part of the hero and become the most vigilant and valiant Red Hunter in the country. But lest we go any further, our exploration question for today's story lecture is... How did McCarthyism impact America during the Cold War and what eventually led to his downfall? But to answer that, I'm going to have to ask you to take your umbrellas out because I got some history to rain upon you first. There were actually legitimate reasons that led to a sense of fear that pervaded the country. Communism was in many ways on the rise across the world and America seemed to be falling behind in the Cold War, causing a lot of self-doubt and nervous reflection. In 1949, the Soviets tested their first atomic bomb, years ahead of what was projected, and America no longer had a monopoly on this weapon. At the same time, Stalin was tightening his control over Eastern Europe. And that same year, the communists under Mao Zedong took control of China. And these developments swung momentum in the Cold War in favor of Team Red. Adding to the paranoia was the realization that there were active communists and Soviet spies operating at some of the highest levels of America's government and in national defense. And the news came quick. Again in 1949, Alger Hiss, a former State Department official who helped to create the United Nations, was accused of being a Soviet spy. One week later, Klaus Fuchs, who had top secret national security clearance, was accused of handing over nuclear secrets to aid the Soviets in the development of their bomb. And later he admitted to this and implicated others as well. So, to combat the Cold War on the home front, the government sprung into action. The House of Un-American Activities Committee, a committee whose name I can't help bring up sounds so very un-American, was created to investigate alleged disloyal and subversive activities. And a different young Red Hunter who grew to fame during these investigations was Richard Nixon, who led the investigation into Alger Hiss. 
Hiss was found guilty of lying to Congress and was discovered to be a communist, but it was never really known in fact if he was a spy. The House of Un-American Activities Committee became most famous for its investigations into Hollywood and the entertainment industry. Hundreds were subpoenaed and faced intimidated hearings where they were grilled and expected to either name the names of potential communists that they knew in the industry or repent and admit to any previous involvement with the Communist Party. If they refused, they had their careers ruined and their reputations tarnished. Most became friendly witnesses like Ronald Reagan, Walt Disney, and Gary Cooper, but some refused to participate in what they saw as a witch hunt that was trampling on the Constitution and Americans' freedoms, especially the First and Fifth Amendments. The Hollywood Ten, a group of writers, directors, and producers, refused to cooperate, defending their rights, and all were cited for contempt of Congress and sentenced to prison terms, and then were blacklisted and could no longer work in the industry. And even though he was a friendly cooperating witness, a young Ronald Reagan spoke out against efforts to sacrifice our values in the fight against communism. He stated, we have spent 170 years in this country on the basis that democracy is strong enough to stand up and fight against the inroads of any ideology. Sir, I detest, I abhor their philosophy, but at the same time, I never as a citizen want to see our country become urged by either fear or resentment of this group that we ever compromise with any of our democratic principles. I still think that democracy can do it. Reagan gave an early warning against the irony of shedding our own freedoms in order to protect those very freedoms. But Reagan's warnings landed on deaf ears. Democratic President Harry Truman created a loyalty board to find potential communists throughout the federal government. The loyalty board investigated more than 3 million federal employees to ensure loyalty to America and the Constitution. However, reasonable doubts alone, forget evidence or due process, was enough to be dismissed or forced into resigning. But the most high-profile anti-red case was the trial of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Julius was a former government engineer who was found guilty of being a Soviet spy and handing them over top secrets that helped them develop their atomic bomb, and then both were sentenced to death by execution. Many Americans, as you can rightly imagine, believed that if communist spies could infiltrate the most secure and important levels of national security, surely they were everywhere. And to save the country, McCarthy hoped to establish himself as a valiant knight, though he was really more of a demagogic Don Quixote, to battle against communism and would slay any constitutional provision that got in his way. One speech would propel McCarthy onto the national stage. Speaking at the Republican Women's Club in Wheeling, West Virginia on February 9th, 1950, McCarthy asserted that there were communists throughout the government and that he possessed a list of 205 card-carrying communists at the State Department. Finally, proof to the fears that so many Americans had, McCarthy became a national sensation and a new leader within the Republican Party. Problem was, his numbers kept changing, and when asked to provide the list, it went from 205 to 57 to 81, and never in fact provided any names or evidence. Undeterred, he later stated, even if there's one communist in the State Department, that would still be one communist too many. It was rather a fast backtrack from 205 to a theoretical one, but that mattered little. Just as he did as a tail gunner, he realized he need not actually hit any targets to become a hero. By making enough noise and firing shots aimlessly, he could still grab media attention and appear to be the hero. McCarthy continuously attacked the Democratic Party for being soft on communism. General Marshall, the war hero and the man behind the Marshall Plan that successfully rebuilt Europe and prevented the spread of communism there, was accused of losing China and being sympathetic towards communists. People who dared stand up and criticize McCarthy for his shrieking defamations, well, that was evidence of their treason and their sympathies with communists. Most politicians, even colleagues who knew the man to be a pathological liar, were stone silent. However, a fellow Republican freshman senator from Maine, Margaret Chase Smith, who grew increasingly appalled that no senior members of the Senate spoke out against McCarthy's dangerous diatribes, decided she needed to break the silence. Addressing the president and the nation, she said of McCarthy, it is a national feeling of fear and frustration that could result in national suicide and the end of everything we Americans hold dear. 
Those of us who shout the loudest about Americanism in making character assassinations are all too frequently those who by our own words and acts ignore some of the basic principles of Americanism. The right to criticize, the right to hold unpopular beliefs, the right to protest, the right of independent thought. But it did little to silence or stop McCarthy. Instead, he was rewarded and appointed chairman of the Senate Committee on Government Operations, increasing his national spotlight. Hundreds were subpoenaed and called in to testify before his committees for being potential communists lurking in the shadows. And as his power increased, so too did his recklessness, taking on larger and larger targets until finally, in the biggest TV event in history at the time, he would be revealed for the fraud and tyrants he was. In his highly publicized probes, McCarthy had already gone after the State Department, the White House, the Treasury, and the CIA, and now he was set to take on the U.S. Army. It was early 1954. McCarthy was at the peak of his power when the McCarthy Army hearings became a television sensation. The drama of the hearings and television broadcast reached their peak when the Army's lawyer, Joseph Welsh, demanded that McCarthy and his committee staff hand over his secret list of alleged communist spies in the army. By now, you might well be able to guess what McCarthy did next. He accused one of Welsh's assistant attorneys for being, you guessed it, a communist, to which Welsh calmly but emphatically fired back, until this moment, Senator, I think I never really gauged your recklessness or your cruelty. And the hearing room burst with applause. And then finally, Welsh asked, have you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Seeing his cruelty and recklessness on TV, millions of Americans had finally had enough and saw the man for who he was. About time. After four long years of baseless accusations, doctored, fabricated, and hearsay evidence that never unearthed a single spy or communist, McCarthy was held to account. Many in his own party finally distanced themselves from him, now that it was safe to do so. Within weeks of the hearings, the Senate voted overwhelmingly to censure him. Though he retained a base of devoted supporters across the country, he fell from grace and fell hard. Out of the national spotlight and frozen in the Senate, he turned to drink and alcoholism and died just a few years later in 1957. Though the Red Scare continued to persist to one degree or another throughout the next few decades of the Cold War, it never again reached the dangerous state of paranoia and governmental abuse during the four years of McCarthyism. But the threat of McCarthyism can not just be confined to the Cold War fear of communists. It represents any threat to our freedoms under the pressure to conform and to fall in line, lest you be labeled an outsider or a traitor or whatever the new communist becomes. And that is the silver lining of McCarthyism, that from its lessons we can recognize would-be tyrants and their witch hunts and to stand up before we tarnish our sacred democratic values. So arm yourselves with history because in the future, you're gonna need it. And thanks for engaging today. This has been History for Humans. And now what you've all been waiting for. Dad jokes in history. Why were the spies always so hard to recognize during McCarthy's hearings? Why? Because they were so communist. Communist. Ah, after that gem, I gotta ask if you could just pull it together enough to click the thumb that looks like this and that wee button that says subscribe. It actually helps me, a teacher, keep making videos like this. And if you want, you can go over to our website and engage with students from around the country in forums and have discussions. And I appreciate you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you next time in our episode on the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if you're doing the learning activity, hang out because we got directions in just a hot moment. Is it Saturday morning? Because I got some cartoons for you. Analyzing political cartoons is a great way to understand the feelings, opinions, and major events in history. And they can help us recognize bias and symbolism and develop our analysis skills. And they're pretty fun and cool as well. But the big question you're gonna be thinking about as you do the learning activity is, how did the Red Scare and McCarthyism impact the civil liberties of Americans? You will first break down each cartoon by identifying important objects in it, thinking about what the title of it represents, and what's a little harder is you're going to be trying to think what was happening in America at that time that could explain what's going on in the cartoon. So try to apply what you learned in this video to that cartoon. 
And lastly, you're gonna read part of a speech from President Truman. You're gonna answer some questions and then identify which cartoon best matches up with different points that he makes in the speech. And there's not necessarily one right answer, and that's why you have to explain your reasoning on why you think that cartoon is the best match. Okay, hope you enjoy it, and I want you to act like geologists on this one and rock it.